Hello, everybody. It's Jason again, and I just wanted to welcome you back to my channel. I want to start by saying I'm incredibly, incredibly moved and incredibly grateful for all of the love and support and positive comments. I had kind of a long and stressful day at work today, and I wasn't planning on a video, but my life is always spontaneous, and even when I have things completely planned out, something else happens. So here I am, and I wanted to share something very personal, very important to me, which is my jewelry that I produce. There had been several comments in the comment sections from many of you about things that I was wearing on my hands and some private messages in regards to what I create in terms of silver jewelry. I was trained at the University of Akron and graduated in the late 1990s. I have produced everything you can imagine from rings to necklaces, bracelets, special commissions, small sculptures, anything that can be viewed as body adornment, I've created. So I focused tonight's talk on just some of my rings that I've produced. There are several hundred that I've made, and I tried my best to give a strong sampling of different materials and some of the designs that I'm known for, if you will. In front of you in the hands is a Herkimer diamond. It's mined in Herkimer, New York. And I just wanted you to have something beautiful to look at in the intro rather than looking at a blank space. I will go camera up soon. I had every intention to do so already, but it was a very hectic day and I for sure look pretty rough. It was pretty, it was pretty tough today. I want to start by showing you a ring that I produced in school. And I had made this ring in my second semester. I'm going to try and refocus this camera because this, there we go. Now I'm learning, huh? So the center stone is a fire agate. And I have discussed my passion for fire agates before. And this ring is for women that hold up the center stone. And the band underneath is pierce work. And you can see the solder seam from behind. This was, I think it was the second or third ring I had ever produced. I was not supposed to be soldering at this time. And the ring is completely hand fabricated and soldered together. I loved it when I got it done. I thought it was just incredible. And when you think about it for just a student work and in intro to metals, I was already thinking ahead. Most students just made a plain shank and didn't really do much to it. And then there was the Jason version and here it is. So that's one of my very earliest creations that I produced in college. I hand fabricate everything with this as an exception. In school, we had to learn how to cast. And I always felt that casting was remotely lazy. I, I don't want to sound cruel or arrogant, but my passion was assembling. Flat sheet, wire, tubing, you name it, solder it together and create something. Casting seemed distant to me. Didn't seem like that important love that you can move the metal and create something from a flat sheet. So this ring was a project in school that we had to learn how to cast. So all the other students were making waxes and I found a rose stem from one of my many failed relationships at the time, and I brought it 
to school. I invested it in the mold and I burnt it out and then filled that with silver. So this was cast and again, a completely wearable ring. Very, very pointy, very, very treacherous to wear. Um, It did draw blood on me three times. (laughs) So not the most practical, but again, I was very driven by concept and storytelling. And I just loved creating. This ring is a compartment piece. And we were told we had to make a compartment didn't necessarily have to be a ring. But of course, mine was there is a door. So we had to make all of this there's a hinge on the back. And on the inside is a mosaic inlay turtle. And he had little moonstone eyes. I created a bezel on the inside of the cage. And I bezel set him on the inside. And again, we hadn't been taught how to bezel set anything. Yet I had to bezel set him. Um, I was a very difficult student, to say the least. I always challenged my teachers and my fellow students. Uh, It was just something that was inside of me at the time. This little door even opens up. So this little hinge opens up so you could, quote, feed the turtle if you wanted to. (laughs) Um, I love this ring, and I haven't seen it for many, many years. So it brought me great joy to bring this out of a box that had been stored in for a very long time. And again, although very large, extremely, extremely wearable and uh, just a fun piece. The next ring was our first stone setting in school, and I had to go big or go home. So I found a smoky uh, uh, topaz quartz, if you want to be technical about it, And I created this mounting. I pierced it out by hand. So all of this pierce work that you see on the sides is completely pierced out by hand. Then again, hand fabricated out of sheet, soldered together. And to get the band to fit onto this top portion, I actually had to sand and file that so that it sat flush. So the craft was strong. And then I soldered the prongs on on the inside of the mounting to give it extra strength because I knew the stone was going to be so large. And again, although gigantic and oversized, extremely, extremely wearable. Um, Still to this day, I do wear and enjoy it. Uh, It is in my cycle of rings that I still wear. And I loved the fact that you could see the pierce work through the stone, that it had life and effervescence, and such detail to reflect through the stone and be pushed back to the viewer. Again, no concept on these, just completely fashionable and wearable. This ring was another stone setting that I did, and this was just after my first semester at school. I wanted to do an oversized tube setting, So all of these sterling silver tubes were cut and soldered by hand. Again, each one routered out down here so that they would sit flush into the silver to get a very strong eutectic. And technically, when you're soldering silver, it's not welding. It's actually soldering. You're putting a solder or a metal in between two other pieces of metal. So welding puts the two pieces of metal together And this is a metal in between the two. And the eutectic is where the two pieces of metal come together. When you see jewelry that has missing parts or that has something broken off, it just means that the eutectic wasn't strong. Something was wrong there, whether it just wasn't a good good bond first and foremost, or if something happened over time with wear and um, abuse, if you will. This ring has been beaten up. As you can see, these used to be completely circular, but I've worn this for a very long time. And the center stone in this one is, again, a smoky quartz, very, very, very large. I believe it was 114 or 115 carats, but I just loved it. And it was very beautifully faceted by a dear friend at the time. So again, just one of the rings that I I still wear and enjoy. And 
I absolutely love. Because I, at times, was that impossible student, we had to do another ring with stone setting, and here was my kind of sarcastic stone setting ring. There was no metal on it. It's just lucite. That was a large, large piece of lucite. And then I just glued in moonstones. And again, it was supposed to be about stone settings. And there I was being one of the most difficult people in the world. <laughs> um, but it came out beautiful. And I still love it. And I think this was in 2002 when I created this one. I then f was using found objects in my work. And this is a very large Bakelite game dice. And there is a central rod of sterling silver that goes up through the dice to hold it in place. Then there's two small tabs of sterling silver and a shank that soldered onto that. So again, completely oversized, very, very, very large. I would wear these to the clubs at the time. I never wanted to blend in. I always wanted to stand out, and this definitely helped me do that at the time. I had so much fun with these pieces, and they were conversation starters. They made people want to speak with me and um, get to know me. And here I am today getting to know you through my work yet again. So kind of full circle. This was a pendant. This bottom portion was a pendant. That was vintage and had a beautiful saying on the back of it. And um, it said, with mind and hand and brush, you make peonies bloom. I filled the holes of the pendant and I drilled out this central hole, sanded it down, filed it, created these little cups, these little bezels that would then contain these fully faceted 360 degree genuine amethyst stones. And this central ring I soldered to the top. This had this engraved Asian symbol. And I soldered on these two, basically, what I considered peony stems to then have these be the blossoms. Um, I, I don't want to get into too much of the meaning on this one, because it does make me very emotional. But it's only a thumb ring now, so it only fits on the thumb. Then this space can balance the ring so that it can be worn on the thumb. It's approximately a size 13, so it's very large. But it does stay balanced when you wear it. So you can see the inside design. And again, just one of the pieces that conceptually I wanted a challenge and I, I didn't want to do something that had already been done before. This ring, speaking of which, <laughs> is definitely something that I don't think had ever been done before in our history. Gigantic, again, oversized, just massive. I did this one in about 2004 or 2005. And again, the talk tonight or this little chit chat isn't in chronological order. So the star was completely pierced out and sawn by sheet sterling, each bezel completely hand constructed, and then soldered down in the old, let's say Navajo mindset of the snake eye turquoise. Each little crystal is then inset into the bezels, and it was going to be mounted flush to my hand. Then I wanted something much more dramatic, so I stepped it up off the hand about an inch and a half. And again, it was only to be fashionable, stand out, and kind of um, a statement piece, a true statement piece. Um, getting back to the found objects that I had used, I found a broken poker chip, and it was Bakelite. So it was two colors, yellow and red. And I was studying Art Deco jewelry at the time, and this was maybe 2005, 2006. So I cut the poker chip in half, and then I created this sterling silver wire, created out of square stock, and then I did an infinity symbol on this side for great balance. And it can be worn in either direction. It reads appropriately that way, and it also reads appropriately this way. And then this is outstanding. This is just outstanding. 
it's so wearable. It's so classy. It's very streamlined. And I wanted it to look Art Deco, but still be by today's hand. I didn't want to make a replica. I didn't want to make something that was a reproduction, but definitely to be inspired by something. I had always looked over my shoulder when I was creating in school, and I had always looked at old pieces just because the design and the craft was outstanding. So this was kind of an homage to the French designers of the 1920s. I wore this ring the other day in one of my videos, and I had several questions about it, so I thought I would pop it on and talk about it. I was going with a Zen garden. I was thinking about a Zen garden, and I created this out of sterling silver again, shank solder to a back panel, and then a bezel set moonstone surrounded by basically pebbles of sterling silver. And just beautiful, wearable, peaceful, and again, very, very large, but um, something that I treasure and I do wear and enjoy frequently. One that I don't wear on a regular basis because I would be worried to really chip or break the stone is this incredible, truly insane lemon citrine, genuine, out of the ground, beautiful stone. I wanted a matchstick type mounting, so I wanted it to look like matchsticks in a way. I stepped it up off the finger quite dramatically. I split the shank here to create a very strong solder seam, and you can unfortunately see where, again, I made it for myself, so I didn't sand that down and finish it like I should have, but I was in a hurry to get it done um, because I wanted to wear it the same day I made it. Um, and then this is completely soldered together, very dramatic, uh, oversized again, don't want to blend in, heaven forbid, and um, just a beautiful stone, and I wanted the light to go through it. So when it's on, it just has this life and this presence and... Um, it's, it's like the sun. It's just like the sun. I had a friend who was in, uh, I believe she was in Oregon at the time. She traveled frequently. I was in school with her. And she sent me this stone back. It was a river rock or it was found on a beach. I drilled it out. I inset these silver rivets. I bezel set it. This was a jelly opal. And quite a large one with great color and great flash that I had bought at a gem show and just stashed. I soldered down two what I consider raindrops or little planets. I again stepped the shank up off the rest of the ring. So I wanted it to be slightly taller, but I also wanted it to be low enough that I wouldn't hit it on anything when I was wearing it since the opal would be so soft. But I was inspired by an artist named Charles Laloma, and he was a Hopi silversmith and did some of the most amazing, amazing Native American silver work that we've ever seen before. And this was very inspired by his designs and also his craftsmanship. So very labor intensive to get these things together. But again, something that I truly love, and I sure hope it comes out in this video, how much I love what I do. This is another found object. It was a Bakelite cherry that was broken, and I soldered a shank down to it. Tons of oxidation from wear, so that's just tarnish. And I wanted it to be a wearable ring. So it's just a cherry. It's bright. It's cheerful, happy. Um, and it kind of also looks like a big red butt. <laughs> so I uh, love that ring because it was found object. This one was also found object, meaning anything that I found that I loved. And it was a knob off of an antique sink from around 1910, 1915. And it is enameled with the word waste. And this, and I hope I don't offend anyone, but this was entered into a show based on designs for engagement rings. And I will leave the rest unsaid. I um, did place in the show. And again, the bezel and the shank are sterling silver. And 
I think the play on words um, was fantastic. For me at the time, um, it meant a great deal. Here is my octopus, what I considered an octopus or a jellyfish. I just went completely crazy. I found a lucite set of, or uh, not a set of, a lucite cluster of grapes. And I cut one in half, and I then carefully made these tiny little sterling silver wires with the finished ends, and then I crafted tendrils and again soldered it into a cup to make the eutectic stronger, and then soldered it to the shank here. So again, extremely large, sits off the hand about three and a half inches, not something I wore every day, but definitely something that uh, was a conversation starter and something that I loved and still love today. I was focused on gemstones for quite a long time. This is a genuine fire opal. It is the largest I had ever seen at any of the gem shows. It is approximately 77 carats. It is of top gem color and top gem clarity. The pierce work on the sides are polka dots, and then I engraved around them. Again, routered out and sanded down so that it would fit on the shank, and then soldered down to hold it in place on the band. Very, 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 very beautiful. Very, 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 very important to me as not only a gemstone, but a ring. Very reminiscent of the smoky quartz from earlier. I found this stone glued to the top of a bolo tie. It was 50 cents at a flea market approximately a year ago. I raced home and removed the clip off of the back that was just glued in place. And then I created this sterling silver bezel and mounting and then soldered it down to half round wire to create the shank. I wasn't sure what stone it was, and I know an awful lot about gemstones, but I did not know what this was. I wore it to a show, and a woman grabbed my hand and told me all about it. She said that it is Mara Mamba, and it was mined in the 60s and 70s, this particular stone and color. Just absolutely beautiful, and if you turn it this way, it does look like a landscape. It is a stunning stone, and I truly appreciate having someone inform me when I don't know information on stones, and I now want to look for these stones because of how beautiful that actually is, and it's very large for its type. A ring that was in one of my other videos was this one, constructed out of tubing, sterling silver again. And I had been asked to bring it back, so here it is. And when it's off the hand, it does lay as a sculpture. I was challenged by this ring because, again, rings are normally a ring or a stone setting and then a shank. And this one is completely fabricated out of tubing. Absolutely 100% tubing. Each piece of tubing is routered out and sanded down by hand and then soldered together, then they're all put in together and soldered together again. Many, many, many solder seams on this ring. And again, very, very wearable and very, very comfortable. Even though it's oversized, it's still a fantastic design that can be worn. And I have worn it several, several, several occasions, and it always gets a lot of attention which is part of I, why I do what I do. I also collect, or I should say, I also support my artists, my friends that are artists. This is a Christy Malcolm original. She's a silversmith here that I went to school with. She was literally one of my best friends in college. And she created this out of a river rock and sterling silver. And she force fit this stone into this bezel without any sort of help or assistance, and then hand fabricated the shank system underneath. 
So very, very direct, very, very pure, and just a fantastic design that is in some way timeless, looks ancient, and then looks like it could have been made yesterday. So a beautiful, handsome, remarkable end result for something so simple. She also created this ring, which it's interesting to go from that to this. She used 14 karat gold on the top to set this beautiful cabochon natural amethyst, and then completely hand raised this hollow formed H shank ring. So this, if you flattened this down, it would be shaped like an H. And then she raised that from flat sheet, soldered it together, soldered the top together, and then she put this inside cylindrical tube that she created into the center of the ring and then soldered that closed as well. So there's a solder seam here that holds that central, uh, shall you say, tube that holds the ring together on the inside. But just a beautiful end result. And she high polishes her work, which I do not do, but she is a master of polishing things. This ring was also done by Christy, and this was a trade between me and her. She made this ring for me. I gave her the opal, and she gave me an opal. We made rings for each other, and then we traded them. She oxidized the inside of this, shall we say, cast. It was silver that was poured into water. So it was silver in a crucible poured into water, and then she connected it with little rubber stoppers so that it could move, a sterling silver barbell in between. She bezel set my opal into this incredible, incredible raised mounting that's open back to let the light through. And then for the shank system, she wanted it to be a two finger ring without having it have two shanks. So she created this and she etched she etched octopus tentacles across the surface because she believes me to be an octopus in life. And I can kind of understand why she thinks that. She's known me long enough to know my traits. And this completely swivels, completely articulates. And then when it's on, when it's on the finger, it does go across two fingers. So it is wearable on two fingers, but only needs one shank system. So it does lay across the hand beautifully, and it does fit the curve of the fingers. So when you're wearing it, it's definitely not in the way. And then it does move on its own as you wear it. So a beautiful end result. And Christina, if you're ever watching this, I miss you. I love you. And let's get together and make some beautiful jewelry, okay? This was one of my last creations, or shall I say my most recent. I'm still working on moving the bezel over. It's not completely finished because I am that staunch person when it comes to bezels. But again, I was challenged by this because I constructed the shank system completely out of tubing. This stone was bought for me by my partner, Jeremy, for Christmas. And I, I asked for a beautiful peridot, and that's exactly what I got. And then I created the shank system to hold that in place on the hand. All of this tubing, again, is completely hand fabricated, soldered together in a very Japanese bamboo style. Very wearable, but it has to be worn on the index finger on either hand. Because of the way the tubing fits, it cannot fit any other finger. So it has to stay on the outside of the hand, or it could be wear worn on the thumb as well. So it can go on the thumb, and then that way it can tilt this way, or it can tilt this way and be worn. So I still have to rock the bezel over and finish the top of it. But that, again, is one of my most recent constructions. I like to push myself when it comes to material. So everybody knows that I love Bakelite and that I have a large collection. These two rings, they have a long, long story. And I can tell you all about it in a future video when I talk about Bakelite. This one was rod stock that was never used from an old factory in Newark, New Jersey. It was modeled and 
stunning orange with trails and marbleized surface throughout the Bakelite rod. I cut it this way. So I cut the rod this way. I cut the rod this way. And then I drilled a hole through the center. I filed and sanded and sawed out this hole. And then I finished the entire piece to make it a wearable ring. And it is absolutely one of the most beautiful colors when it comes to orange. So saturated, just a beauty. No denying it. And I keep saying beautiful because these things to me are beautiful. I feel honored that I have the ability to create these things, but also it does take a lot of courage for an artist to create. And I know that sounds strange, but it's totally true. It does take courage to create, and I'm honored to do so. This ring is just a powerhouse. I loved the vintage Bakelite rings, but they never fit because the central hole here was always around a five, six, a five or a six. It never was above that. And I need a 10 to be able to wear it. So I had to create my own. And that's exactly what I did. And the second version, I like to really push myself. There isn't anyone today that has figured out how to make random dot Bakelite jewelry. And I made this. I found a way. I have the secret, but I'll fill you in a little bit. I bought undrilled Bakelite beads that don't have a hole in them. And they came in a bag of about 6,000. They were out of a factory and they were varied sizes. And I invested them in, I will re refrain from giving my secret on what they were invested in, but a black material that's very much so like plastic, that's not Bakelite. Then I did the same thing I did with the other ring. I cut the rod, I drilled a hole, and then I made it a wearable ring. When I cut into the Bakelite balls or orbs, they were paper white. They were as white as a sheet of paper. And these have oxidized to the classic creamed corn color. But again, I made this ring over 15 years ago and has oxidized just like the old Bakelite. So an extraordinary push of material and design to recreate something that has been lost to time. And I really love it. And I hope you do too. The final piece I wanted to show is a hinged Lucite bracelet that I made in 2001. It is an old Lucite bangle that I sawed in half. I do not destroy vintage or old pieces. I don't redo them. But this had a nasty chip on the inside of one of the edges that could not be buffed out. And since it was just a plain Lucite bangle, I didn't feel guilty cutting it in half and giving it a new life. I feel that I did a relatively good job with these hinges. So you pull this pin out and it opens up to get it on and then you close it and then you put the pin back in and then it's a rigid bangle again. Sterling silver on both sides so the bezels hold the lucite part or lucite parts I should say. And then on the inside of the lucite are sterling silver bezel cups and then abalone shell that have been bezel set inside of sterling silver. So the push and pull of the polka dots is very optic and very crystal-like. I wanted to give just a, a final statement from, this was 2000, between 2000 and 2001, I did an artist statement on these Lucite pieces and it, it specifically reads, I have always found my life an appropriate subject matter for my art. I own and define every facet of my being in my work. As Rainer Maria Rilke once wrote, if your everyday life appears to be unworthy subject, subject matter, do not complain to life, complain to yourself. Unlike most contemporary artists, I have infrequently worked outside of myself or worked with ideals that do not define my individuality. Due to this passion for self-exploration, 
both in metalwork and photography, I have defined myself as a post-romantic artist. From the day I first picked up a jeweler saw to my current body of lucite jewelry, my art objects, body adornment, and photography have deciphered and objectified my essence. My intent with my current lucite jewelry is to utilize my technical knowledge and design aesthetics. My past work was very conceptual, which I do not feel is relevant to this body of work. I wanted to focus on the purity of lucite and accent it with vibrantly colored stones. This lucite jewelry is fun and lighthearted, steering clear of the overwhelming conceptual overtones I customarily use. However, to me, each piece is a celebration of life. In conclusion, as an artist, I never doubt my intuition. I work with subject matter that I personally know and feel is crucial to share with others. The items that I produce are extensions of my spiritual life. Because of this factor, I will always have the desire to create and the power to do so. I leave you with that as a final thought. I know that I went a little bit past my time on this and I stumbled a few times because, again, I'm a little tired out, but I felt like I wanted to share. I will be doing for future videos on my designs and my art. I would love to be able to share my photography with you as well. So that's definitely coming. I want to thank you all for watching this. I truly want to thank you for your time and please, please, like and subscribe and send me any comments that you wish. If you'd like to see something specific or if I used a term that you weren't sure about, please let me know and I'd love to clarify. Thank you all so much and you know this already. I love you.